Welcome back to the 2022 Retail Tech Show in London, England. I'm Mike Giambattista. I'm here with three esteemed guests and a roundtable panel to discuss journeying to the next level of commerce, preparing for the return of demand. Um, but let me make some introductions and we can get this going. Paul Rogers is chairman at Vendorcom. Since its launch in 2003, Vendorcom has been helping to shape Europe's collaborative, <coughs> competitive payments landscape and is the most trusted independent forum for suppliers and users of payment systems in Europe. Paul, thank you for joining us. Delighted. Simon Fairbairn is head of professional services EMEA at Ingenico. In October of 2020, Ingenico joined Worldline as now part of the largest European player in payment services and the fourth largest player worldwide. And Genico's services now support almost a million merchants. Simon, thanks for this. Thank you. And Tony Hammond, SVP Global Product Delivery at FreedomPay, the data-driven commerce platform that transforms existing payment systems and processes from legacy to leading edge. FreedomPay's adaptive technology connects to current payment systems to drive next level performance and of course, sponsors this round table. Each of you have a unique perspective on the marketplace because of what you do and where you sit within the ecosystem. So I think we've gotten really lucky to have these voices in one place discussing such a critical topic. Your 100,000 foot views on the space allow you to see patterns and trends that nobody else really sees. So let's get right into it. We're interested in your perspectives on the sector, retail, we're interested in your perspectives on technologies, and of course, how payments are at once enabling and driving these changes. So question one, and then I'll be quiet and let you guys do the talking. Let's start 12 months in the future, because what's happening now in the marketplace is no longer prescriptive, it's table stakes. With the retail sector, 12 months from now, what will consumers be doing that retailers need to be thinking about right now? Let's start with Simon. Uh, good question. So I think, you know, to look forward to the past 12, the, the next 12 months, you've actually got to consider what's been happening over the past couple of years. Because when we hit the pandemic, it felt like the retail apocalypse. The world started to fall apart. But the, the bit that carried me through is, like Benjamin Franklin said, there's only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Well, there's not, there's a third, there's payments. You know, and the reality is, whilst it went down, it's rebounding hard, and people want that physical dimension. They want to get back in this space. They've got money to spend, they want experiences, and, and they're looking for something new. Now, what does that mean? Um, for me, I, I think there's, there's a, a real tension starting to creep in. And there's a tension in one dimension between simplicity and complexity. So from a customer perspective, I want everything simple. I want seamless payment. I want invisible payment. I don't even want to know that I have to go through that. You know, if you ask a simple question, who designed a queue? Who was the person that actually said, queue's a good way, it's a customer experience. I designed that. Never would happen. That's a business view of the world. And customers are looking for a challenge. They're looking for better ways where the payment is not a chore. They're looking to be able to get that, that blend between online between in-store, the, the click and delivery, the click and collect, the, the search online, buy on store, but buy online in store. These things are blurring, can we keep up? So the complexity behind the scenes is actually how does the payment community actually deal with that? Because the world is now getting really, really hard. How do you get all of the points of integration, all of the different partnerships, all of the different players into that mix? But retail's definitely here to play, say. There's definitely much more things going on, more ways to pay, more routes to make your payments, more places to do it, more services you can, you can start to, to bring together. And I think, you know, if I just kind of sum that up, I think for me, when you look at the payment dimension in particular, what you see in the retail store is no longer about payment, it's a point of trust. It's a place where actually you invest your belief in that something can happen here in a way that's going to be safe and secure. Whether that's payment or a, a value added service, a collection point, a gathering of information, you know, I think we need to really broaden our horizons of how that works and think about how that joins into a wider ecosystem. And that's tough for a retailer because a retailer is always playing catch up but the customer is demanding. But if you service that demand, you deliver the payment experience and the payment experience is good, you win the battle. From a technology standpoint, from a trend standpoint, well, like from, from my view of this, I completely agree with uh, what Simon said. And I, I, I think 
while the merchant's playing catch up, any solutions provider that's trying to serve that merchant is at risk of being in even more of a catch up position and this is where for the solutions providers staying really close to what the consumer really requires is absolutely essential and also not just looking at the retail uh, world as being one distinct world when you look at all of the different flavors whether that's uh, on the whether it's by channel uh, face to face e-commerce unattended or uh, in call centers, or whether you look at it in different merchant sectors, luxury, fashion, uh, DIY, uh, grocery. Again, being able to be understood as a consumer in each of those different contexts, because you, have a, you want to have a completely different experience, and the payments piece is fundamental to that. I'm intrigued by how you phrase the question, that there's a tension between the complexity that underpins the simplicity that we're all after, on that last mile delivery, if you will, yeah. to the customer. Um, so I'm going to throw this over to you, Tony, because you deal with a lot of the technical side of this. Well, I think, um, you know, if you're asking me about how the uh, technology is going, likely to play out, I think, um, you know, we're seeing at the moment with, uh, you know, economic uh, influences at the moment, we see inflation rising, we're seeing, we're seeing interest rates beginning to rise, we're seeing pressure, if you like, on disposable uh, incomes. I think from a merchant's point of view now, they, they need to be looking to technology to make, to ensure that they can grab every single customer that uh, is available to them. And uh, certainly I think now increasingly we're seeing demand for uh, you know, increased uh, loyalty uh, solutions in that you, you know, customer retention is absolutely vital, but so too is actually acquiring new customers. So, you know, I mean, I think from a technological point of view, the, the merchant wants to know who their customer is, where they buy, what they buy, how they buy, right? So I think increasingly for the, over this next 12 months, it's going to be vital that the merchants are, uh, you know, considering how they're actually nurturing their customers, particularly as we're moving increasingly towards a self-service environment, right? There's so much self-checkout these days and, uh, you know, scan your own goods and pay and so on and so forth. So there's no longer that personal touch point you know, between the retailer in a lot of cases. And yeah. although you may go into a physical shop and actually make a purchase, uh, very rarely would you actually have an interaction with a sales assistant, unless you're talking about something like apparel. But certainly in the convenience stores and grocery and so on, it really is that self-service environment where nobody really gets to know their customer. So I think, I think as, as, as we see that, um, you know, pressure on people's disposable incomes, there needs to be uh, efforts, uh, you know, placed on the part of the uh, the merchants to uh, retain more of the customers they have, but also acquire more. I'm, I'm intrigued by just the way this conversation is going yeah. because it, payments have, have never been a directly linear process. It was never really a, you know, my money starts here and ends here in one link. It's, but it seems to me that it's growing uh, exponentially more complex, especially since pandemic, because now we're fitting in all of these other factors into that same chain. Yet, retailers, first of all, consumers will never want to know what's really happening. They just need to trust, as you said. But retailers and brands probably don't want to know this either. So that leaves us here to figure out how to pack all that technology, all those options, all those, those potential nodes on an omni-channel experience into that existing chain. I don't even know how that works. Well, I think it's been interesting, hasn't it, over recent years, how we've seen payment methods and payment instruments evolve, right? You know, once upon a time we had a humble credit card, right, or we had cash. Now we're, now we're using QR codes to identify ourselves. We've got different means of authentication. We've got the introduction of biometrics, you know, into the, into the payment cycle. And we've got a myriad of alternative payment methods, right, that we never had previously, right, electronic-based, both for use in face-to-face -face transactions as well as e-commerce. I mean, you'll, you'll know this, I think, as, as, as a terminal provider, how it is terminals today are gathering more oh, than totally, just totally. a card, uh, or more than just card data, right? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, again, there's like another tension, you know, like I talked about the simplification part and uh, the complexity, but diversification versus unification, you know, we're just seeing that massive expansion of a variety of things. So, you know, when I talk about point of trust as a terminal, and we're, we're only one supplier, but yeah, you can take your credit card, your debit card. There's still a place for cash. You know, we're not going to get away. Financial inclusivity is key. We've got QR codes for alternative payments. We're now looking at faster payments from bank to bank transfers. Uh, we have a number of schemes running in some countries where we'll take stable coin. So you've got this, this, this massive growth. And the FinTechs have been fabulous over the innovation, 
but as a retailer you're left with a which path do I follow Brown, yeah. you know which horse do I want to back it's like the Grand National yeah. multiplied by a thousand yeah. suddenly I've got 40,000 choices and, and it's going to cost me money you know and I think that's where the pressure is starting to come back on that you know well actually what will be the standards what is the route what is the best way I can provide a unified offering to my customer and I think to build in your point Tony I think that loyalty thing is really really key and, and I think the only way we're going to be able to deliver that cohesive offering is partnerships the days of being, I have one supplier who does everything is gone. Actually, you're going to have to see big organizations figuring out how to work you know, much better together. You know, For me, the, the thing that really steals the market is has been the very quiet rise of the API. That's the little bit of glue that's joined so many things together that allows us all to play together to start to journey down this unification thing. But if you don't own or are able to deliver that sensible, seamless offering to your customers and it jars, They'll vote with their feet because they can do it online. They can do it on the shop two down, down the road. They can do it, you know, <coughs> with a shop in a country four thousand miles from here. Yeah. So you know, you've really got to invest deliberate uh, consideration of what it is you're going to do and how you're going to do it, and that's tough. I think that's a really great way of looking at it because at the moment you can kind of see four big things that are driving innovation. You've got legislation, regulation, uh, standards, and technology. Now that's what as solutions vendors, we'd say, right, that's what's going to drive things. And actually, it will drive those things. But when you look at it from a merchant perspective, yeah. they're trying to make sense of all of that. So yeah. the FinTech guys are coming in, but so are the regulators, and they're driving pay yeah. change at a pace and in a direction that we might not have thought. And it's some of it's good, some of it actually is really not so good. But actually, what should really be driving <laughs> things in this post-pandemic phase that hopefully we are now in, is things like, for most merchants, just keeping the lights on in their business. Right. And if, if uh, solutions vendors can't relate to that and say, actually we're going to help you on really pragmatic, simple, straightforward things that deliver to the bottom line or deliver in terms of customer experience, like you say, interoperably, securely, protecting the customer. Yeah. And so all the innovations, all the regulation can come from whatever angle it needs to, but unless it really makes sense in a merchant mind, it's not going to actually happen in reality because there's a big difference between the origination of a standard or FinTech or legislation and actually the merchant deployment of a particular solution. And there's even longer until consumers adopt that and it can be eight, 10, 12 years. And we need to work and walk on the journey with the merchant and help them because they're just caught in the headlights of all of this change that's hitting them. And unless <coughs> you can demonstrate that empathy and put your arm around that merchant, you might as well go home. Well, well let's, if I may, because that's a direction that we could spend the next couple yeah, hours, well, of course. and <laughs> maybe we should. Um, but I wanted to take that just a little bit um, because I think you've prompted something here. If, if a merchant isn't thinking about the next 12 months right now, they, they've already lost that window. That window is already gone. And, and you in particular have a, have a view to, I think, uh, maybe better than most people in this room, uh, what those trends are and what they're doing. So, so maybe if, if we could put on the crystal ball a little bit and, and talk about what kinds of technologies retailers in the payments world should be paying attention to to enable them to remain competitive over the next 12 to 24 months that they may not be aware of. Well, like, again, I'm in a really fortunate position to have that perspective, perspective across payment types, payment channels, uh, different merchant market sectors, and the things that overarch all of those. And in doing that, I would say, yes, a merchant should be focusing in on the technology, but that's only one part of it. They need to be scanning the horizon, and they need to be working with their existing solutions providers and others working with the regulators, starting to actually find their own voice about what it is that a merchant wants. Um, it's really interesting the angle you, you were uh, uh, taking just there, and I think it's so, so valid. As a merchant tries to work out how to make sense of all of this, once they do, how do they get that into the mix? Is it with their solution providers or with the, the, the regulator or with government or whoever? And so in terms of what's coming down the line, I very rarely, uh, fall into the trap of getting that crystal ball out and reading it and making gr any grand pronouncements. But what I would say is there's some things on the near horizon that are now on our Vendorcom watch list, and that is 
bank-based payments. We're already seeing account-to-account -account payments through the open banking stimulated, the regulatory stimu stimulated surge there. Some of it's regulatory stimulated, some of it's technology stimulated. But I think that's starting to move forward. But again, pushing that out as a, oh, this is the new thing and it's right for everyone, is not the right way to look at it. Merchants need to look at what's right for them in their individual demographic, geography, uh, and, and, and product set or whatever. But bank-based payments, account to account, using perhaps QR as an interface, a completely different interface than we perhaps have in normal face-to-face -face or even e-com right now. But also, we're seeing crypto pay. Uh, I got a bit ahead of myself six, seven years ago and started to look at Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrencies as being the way forward. And I'm not saying they're not, but that was a bit early. We're now seeing crypto payments in its uh, wider theme start to come into the realms of reality in a way that it just wasn't there before. But this is when we talk about total payment acceptance landscape. As you said, you can't exclude cash. You can't exclude cash. We're rubbish at sunsetting anything within the payments world. <coughs> and actually, the consumers, I don't believe, want us to sunset any one thing. We've got a demographic that's going through 70, 80 years of demographic. And it's not like the whole community suddenly changes. We've got those folks that are wedded to cash and we're hearing it in the news today. Is government going to legislate for cash? I don't know, they did it in Sweden. But there are many new initiatives coming through that we need to work out. Where does this fit? Where does it fit in the socio-economic demographic? Because many things aren't going to be forced in by a techno technology provider or by a regulator. It's going to be about mass population saying, I need to buy stuff. It's simple as that, and the more we can keep our feet on the ground of going, actually, the, a lot of the future looks a lot like today, and there's no, I say no, there's very few big, big step changes, and if there are, that's typically legislation-led, not technology-led, not market forces-led, not standards-led, it is regulatory-led. So the biggest step change we have ever seen, which was chip and pin, nearly 20 years ago. We've seen other changes nearly get us to a step, but it was a fast ramp up, contactless payments. Actually, it was a, it was a 10 year burn. So we need <laughs> to look at uh, the pace of these changes actually coming but, but through. But don't you think, Paul, that really we've, we've seen the pandemic has re really spurred you know, yes, the sir. adoption of uh, contactless and touchless Absolutely. payments in, in general, right? We've all, yeah. we've all been affected by that. And, uh, you know, very high demand from merchants now for, for contactless. It's yeah. mass, mass adoption, if you like. And uh, even the consumer these days now is demanding it. We, we almost don't carry cash at yeah. all now. And clearly yeah. there are some of the unbanked uh, that do have to be uh, considered. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I find it interesting what you had to say about uh, open banking and faster payments, right? Yeah. Because, you know, we've seen exponential rises in uh, open banking, yeah. faster payments over the last couple of years, and I think that that, that curve is going to continue up. I mean, yeah. what, what's your thoughts? We, we talk about them wanting to you know, consider what, what happens with cash, but when it does not seem to be displacing debit card transactions. Debit card transactions are as strong as ever, yeah. but the faster payments, open banking payments themselves are growing exponentially, so what, what's, what's sitting behind that? Well, they are growing, and they're going to continue to grow, but they're growing from a very low base, and I think, so get in there and, and take advantage of that from the earliest stage, but don't expect any payment type now uh, or any payment channel uh, to be the 50, 60% that cards might have been eight, 10 plus years <coughs> ago. Uh, there's still a big market if you can grab five, 10, 15% but you've got to work at a, a much, much lower base. So I think there's real potential for bank-based payments, for faster payments, for request to pay and so on. But it's got to replicate at its very, very basic level what cards offer. If it doesn't offer uh, the basics there on uh, confirmation of pay, you know who you are paying. If it doesn't uh, replicate the uh, refund uh, or the uh, if you have to charge back or there, there's some uh, there's, there's some recourse needed. Cards, the biggest challenge to bank-based payments is cards work. Now, you could argue the cost bit of bank-based payments is going to really break through, and you could argue that the uh, irrevocable payment uh, nature of a, a, of a payment to the merchant will win through. Now, that's a good plus for the merchant, but 
post-pandemic, who's going to be paying for their airline ticket or their hotel bill on a bank-based, once it's gone, it's gone uh, type of, of payment mechanism. Now, of course, the, leg <coughs> the regulators will bring controls in there. There are already some controls in terms of getting your money back. But we, we already saw, even with uh, the protections that cards give, that some airlines, some hotel chains, weren't exactly very consumer friendly when it came to getting refunds back in March, April, May 2020. So it's about, as we've already said before, being really close to what a consumer really wants. And that's what's going to make the demand for these new forms of payment. I want to key off something you said a moment ago, um, in that, that there are some trends and technologies that are worth paying attention to. Yep. And then there are probably some that aren't. So let's turn this over a little bit and, yep. and talk about, you know, because there's a lot of shiny objects in payments. Yep. I mean, you know, the, the, for instance, and not to pick on Amazon, but um, over in the US we had Amazon Go yep. shops pop up, um, which were utterly contactless. Yep. Um, just walk in, walk out, basically. Don't have to do anything but show up. Um, and they folded, so, or at least they folded some of them. Which to me means, Look, it's a, it was a really interesting idea and there was a huge amount of PR value in it, but did it really work as, as, a, as a payment technology that was going to get wide adoption? But are there other shiny objects, if that even qualifies as one, that we yep. should basically kind of move past? Yeah, there are a lot of shiny objects out there right now. And, and that's fine, because we can all learn from them. I was a mentor at the Level 39 payment or FinTech Accelerator back 2011, 2012, and a lot of those things were great, great science experiments, and we can all learn from those. But the real, one of the best things that happened was when we saw the economic crunch, and uh, organizations then really, uh, and, and funders really going, oh right, I might have invested in something that I'm not really going to see some return fr from. But what they <laughs> were, were seeing is that actually if they melded together some of their investments, oh you're doing this payment technology and you're doing this, bring them together and then you've really got something that's worthwhile. And um, so I see a lot, of, a lot of shiny objects and I think it's a case of go as far as you can, experiment. We need to prototype more, we need to be flexible and this is where the imbalance comes, where the regulators involved. Um, the, the Financial Conduct Authority sandbox in the UK is a great place to test something but we're in a regulated market, it's got to be internationally interoperable, secure, protecting the customer, resilient, ubiquitous, low cost. And those are really contrasting and conflicting uh, requirements. But if the regulator can be a bit more relaxed and say, actually we can make some of these things work, let's push the boundaries in some areas, then I think that will help. But I also think, it, it brings me to one of my favorite expressions, don't bet your business on some of these fancy bells and whistles, mm. the jazz hands of the FinTech world. But see what they can do, because my favorite expression is, it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. And you've got to be a fast follower though, because there's not much cheese left for mouse three and four. So it's not a case of going, oh, I don't need to worry about that, that's just going to die. Um, it's a case of going, okay, you need to watch what, what we're going to learn, see that first mover get their head chopped off, and then dive in for the cheese that's inevitably is going to come after that. I, I, I agree with a lot you said there, you know, I think, some of the innovation has been really interesting to watch, and, but even to fail, the learnings that come from it, what, it, what it's doing is informing us the art of what's possible. You know, where could we go with this? And I think you're absolutely right, starting to see things joining up. The bit for me that, that we, we kind of often miss is we look at the tech and get all excited, the legislation tries to do something to kind of cover that situation, but right at the other end of the thing is the thing that really drives the change, the consumer. Because yep. the consumer's the one going to use it. And the things that we, we sometimes miss, because when you look back at debit cards and credit cards, they weren't an oversight success. They mm. took a long time to climb the mm. hill. And I think to your point on faster payments, it'll come, but it's not going to be some, boom, you know, here we are, 70% of it's there. It has to be compelling. Yeah. So there has to be really, really clear utility. Is this better than what I've already got? Yep. It has to be mm. familiar. So I have to be able to get comfortable with it. For ages, things like debit cards, is this bit of plastic, what does yeah. it do? No, contact, you know, you know, trying to get people to use Apple Pay on their phone. What, my phone can make a payment? It was like a revolution. But then suddenly we're all doing it, and, and sometimes you need these points of inflection that pushes over the edge, and enough people gather momentum. But the quality that's that really locks in for me is trust. And this is where a lot of the big vendors come in, 
you know, particularly the likes of Freedom Pay, you know, in Genico, the worlds we inhabit, is you may have some great fintechs, you may have some great shiny things, but ultimately the merchant and the consumer look to the brands they trust, the ones they know can secure, because we're talking about money here. We're talking about me taking something out of my account and maybe never seeing it again. I need to know it's going to work. What's, what's, what's that brand going to tell me? And I think you know, there's a really powerful qualities that sometimes we miss. In the rush for innovation, actually at the end of that, there's a bunch of people buying it and there's a bunch of people using it. You know, and that, that kind of com makes things a little bit more complex, yeah. but you start to understand some of the, the rationales, why maybe it takes a bit of time, why suddenly you get a surge forward when things change. But people are people, you know, yeah. there's nothing quite like them. <laughs> I think I would say, I mean, what's interesting as you look at, you know, the emergence of all these new, uh, new approaches to uh, making payments, electronic payments particularly, I think you have to look at what's enabled some to succeed versus others failing, right? Yeah. And a lot of those that have succeeded has been largely because of the speed, the yeah. convenience, yeah. and to your point, let's call it security, yeah. the trust, right, in the, in, it, in, in, in the product itself. And I, this is why you've seen the success of products like Apple Pay, Google Pay, yeah. Samsung Pay, right? You, you know, there's very big brands standing behind those and yeah. giving guarantees, if you like, to the users of them. But importantly, I think the other element that's important to succeed is differentiation. What do you bring yeah. to the party other than just the convenience and speed, right? I mean, this, this is where those, uh, yeah. you know, the company's offering, you know, the benefits of rewards, incentives, you know, uh, analyzing what you're buying and what you're, what you're seeing and how you know how, how you can influence in so, someone's purchase you know through through the medium that they actually use to pay I think is going to be uh, vital to that and this is where we're seeing an emergence of more and more technologies you know to uh, to get to reward the consumer for who they're buying uh, you know their product from some, some of the research we've been doing because you know it's you know we sometimes look at the tech and the kind of takes the payment but the data that sits behind it is just of enormous value you know and when you multiply that by trillions you know those data points are phenomenal you know, and we're really just at the start of that curve around AI and ML. So, you know, we talk about the next 12 months, is that going to happen? No. Is it happening? Yes. It is absolutely happening behind the scenes. <coughs> we're looking at it around fraud analysis, we're looking at uh, patterns of buying behavior, we're looking at how we blend the online and the retail. You know, I buy a shirt online and I can go into the store and I start kind of interacting with the store. The store starts to recognize, weren't you the guy who was buying the shirt but never mm, yeah. completed the transaction? It's like, okay, I'm getting a little bit scared, so trust security becomes an even bigger factor because privacy is now kicked in. But the reality of it is getting more clever, more complex, and it really feeds that ability to deliver you know, real top-end experiences and give that point of differentiation. Uh, you know, we're just at the start of that journey. It's not just about this thing's a little bit faster anymore, like you say. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's lots of other things that you, know, you don't have to understand to use, but can be incredibly powerful for your business. I'm going to bring this a little closer to home. Uh, is the payments industry has been responding to and in some very real ways driving the changes in the ways consumers make purchases. Uh, it's one thing to respond to uh, what the data is telling you, what consumers like, but a lot of that change, let's face it, has come from the innovation that's, that's, that's been birthed within payments. So I just want to put this out there. Uh, and I think you three are probably great people to talk about this, we're on the threshold of some very big changes in the way people buy and pay. What do you think some of those are from the consumer standpoint? What consumer-driven changes should the payments industry keep an eye out for at this point? Hey, can, I, can I drop in the first one? And then, because there's a million things, but as a consumer, you need to know me. And, and it starts with that premise because then the payment experience and all of that journey, the customer experience around it, is then tailored relative to what I need. If I'm shopping for petrol or groceries or grabbing a coffee, do I want a handheld personalized experience that takes me 10 minutes to process? Absolutely not. I'm looking for convenience, I'm looking for simplicity, I'm looking for speed. If I'm buying my first Porsche, I want to see and I want to enjoy that moment. You know, I actually, you know, I'm ready for parting with that amount of money. I'm ready to be taken on some thing. And it's all about knowing me as the customer. So as a merchant, how do you create your payment experience, recognize your market, your customer, your dynamic, and then individualize it to, to whoever walks in the store? And, and I think once you start to do that, lots of things flow. You know, this is where payments is inextricably linked to identity. And we've got to get that bit so well tied up. Yeah. But the, the merchant um, is often excluded from some of the discussions that the payment solutions providers are engaging there. Yeah. And, and, and actually to the detriment 
uh, of the overall experience because merchants have got more intelligence around that customer uh, because of the years of interaction. Even if it's basic, even if it's not digital, they've still got good records and we can build and build and build on that. And that's really where the, the banking community, the payments community, uh, particularly commu uh, payments solutions vendors and the merchant community need to come together. Banks, when they uh, operate as a source of funds, they think they're getting involved in the payments industry, but they're not really. They're, 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 there's maybe a little bit of an interface there. But, and they, they go, oh, well, that's our, our customer. They see the customer as their card holder. And they go, oh, that's our customer as a, as a card holder. The retailers go, well, we're not sharing any of our data because they're, they're our consumer customer. And the solutions vendors are stuck in the middle trying to integrate through, and the API piece is absolutely crucial, both for standard card payments, <coughs> um, uh, but particularly with, with bank-based payments. We need to get all stakeholders right up and down the, the community, schemes, issuers, acquirers, payment processors, payment gateways, merchants, all the security folks that are around that need to get them coming together. Collaboration is absolutely key. I set Vendor come up on the premise of innovation couldn't really be delivered at scale for the merchant community unless we uh, collaborated. And that's coming through even more now. There's way too much to be done for any one organization to do it completely. I don't care how big some of the organizations around here, they're never going to deliver the whole thing on, as one. And so a collaborative stance to this, understanding what the integration is, understanding what your sweet spot is, understanding how collaboration and competition can coexist, that's going to be crucial. And it, again, getting the merchants into that discussion has got to be the way forward. I also, I also think though, from a, from a consumer perspective, I think it's not just about the security, it's about the trust and protection, yep. right? I, for example, when we look at you know, the long established and, and highly evolved card schemes, they come to your point earlier yeah. with the prote a buyer protection, yeah. right? And if there should be a dispute between the, yep. you know, the payer and the payee, there's, you can fall back on your card company or your bank to, yeah. to help you with that dispute and recover your, your money, right? Some even go so far as to provide you insurance on the, yeah, on yeah. the purchase, right? A lot of these new and novel uh, you know, payment methods don't come with those protections, yeah. right? Even to the point about open, uh, open banking, Re refund mechanisms are not, are not, if you like, standard. There are many companies that are stepping in now to provide such mechanisms as, as, as re refunding in that, in that context. But, you know, as I say, I also want protection of my data, my personal data, yep. right? I'm sharing even more data than I ever did before, and merchants have to be worried about things like GDPR, yep. uh, you know, in general personal, uh, you know, data protection. So equally, when I'm when I'm uh, you know making a payment through whatever method, I want to make sure that yeah. both the correct information is being transferred, but equally that it's not being shared with anyone other than the people that I'm actually conducting my my purchase with. That's absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. So uh, we we've opened this up for questions from viewers. Um, one here uh, on crypto. Oh, yeah. it, it, everybody's talking about it, you mentioned it a moment ago. Uh, nobody knows what to do with it as, as it relates to payments whatsoever, except possibly you three. So, <laughs> what do you think? Is, is this a topic that we should be talking about and thinking about right now? It, it is absolutely a topic to be talking about right now, but talking about it is probably the most important thing. Starting to understand what your uh, total payment acceptance strategy should be. What's the what's what's big? What's small? What's going to come in over the next year? Mm. What's one to watch for coming in over the next five years? So that like, a lot of the investment in payment systems by merchants are being put in place for a five to 10 year sort of time frame. So you can't just go, oh I don't need to look at this now. Because if, you have, if you're coming up to buying something in the next two years that you're going to have in place for the 10 years after that, you've got to make sure that some of these new things that are sitting on or beyond the horizon right now can be accommodated in, in that. So definitely want to talk about, it's on our watch list. We covered it in terms of crypto payments. Let's not just talk about cryptocurrencies in general. Cryptocurrencies are there like currencies are there, like any source of funds. It's how do you make that currency into something that you can pay with? It's got the international interoperability, the trust and everything else, the, the protections that go with it. And at the moment, 
Some of those are there. Uh, there's a different mindset to it all, but there are solutions providers that are there right now. All I would say is, be very mindful of, it's the second most that gets the cheese when it comes to crypto payments. Right, and be fast acting in three and four, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can't just sit back, you've got to be a fast follower. I have to say though, I mean there's lo lots of merchants already accepting lots of different currencies, yeah. right? But they'll they'll only accept certain currencies depending on the, you know, the volatility of that currency, yeah. right? No no one wants to accept the currency that maybe you you bank it tomorrow but it's actually already lost value today. And I think this is the one thing with crypto is the volatility, right? Is the massive shifts in in the in in the exchange rates that can occur from one day to the next. But to your point, it's a question of how do I actually monetize that that cryptocurrency, you know, yeah. where, where can I pay with it and through what me mechanism? And I think with a lot of the cryptos, because by their nature they're decentralized, right? There's not one body necessarily driving standardization uh, within it. So, yeah. so how do you, you know, basically articulate a, a solution and a, 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 a proposition for actually making physical payments of a cryptocurrency at the point of sale? These are the sorts of things the merchant has to think about when sort of looking to, to, to accept I think, them. To your point, I think absolutely there's, there's, there's a conversation happening and we've got to keep having the conversation because this is coming, it's, it's happening, and it's got to happen with some measure of control. But I think there's also, uh, you know, as we as we talk about it, we've also got to educate about it. Yeah. And we've got to start to demystify it. <laughs> because actually what everyone does is talk about cryptocurrency, but, it, but it's so much more than that. You know, we mix blockchain with crypto, we then bring in digital cash, we bring in stable, stable coin. Yeah. Yeah. The reality is, is, is you know, for the kind of payment mechanisms, we're talking more about stable coin, of which there is already a variety of mechanisms operating in other countries when you can do it because you don't have the currency issue. Yeah. It's a fiat currency, it's underpinned, it's stable. But when you've got something as volatile as Bitcoin or Dogecoin, then it's a completely different animal. That's an investment vehicle or it has other purposes. And it's either driven by anonymity or it's driven by ability to transact in markets that maybe are a little bit more suspect. You know, there, there are a huge amount of benefits, but maybe that's not the one to play. But actually, if you take back where the stablecoin is, well, the European Central Bank is getting into the game. Bank of England is, is talking about now starting to, to go down that route. And actually, this is part of the route out of cash, because you'll start to look at stablecoin as, a, as an alternative to cash, that's cash equivalent, but it's now digital, because the world is digitalizing, that's, that's happening. So I think, for me, demystify it, educate, keep talking about it, but it's not going to be a case of 10 years from now it all happens, you're going to see things start to land. A bit like QR codes. QR codes are, 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 have grown prevalence in the UK because we had China Union Pay and Alipay and yeah. WeChat because we had a large volume of tourists. It's backed off a bit because pandemic shut us all down, yeah. but now we started to say, well actually QR codes offers other utility. Yeah. You know, coins, digital coins, digital currency will be the same. You know, we'll find other uses, we'll find other ways, and it will percolate in. You know, it won't be, again, 60% <coughs> overnight, but people will find purpose. And then they'll start to find other bits of utility. If I can start to do transactional ownership, yeah. you know, I can do contract conferment, you know, on top of a digital currency, I can't do that with cash, I can't do that with MasterCard, yeah. you know, I can't do that with Visa, you know, but there's a long way from being understood and being ready, but that blockchain capability behind it. And, yeah. and this is where there, there's horses for courses when it comes to payments. There's not all payment types are right in every merchant scenario. You're looking at, when you look at um, crypto being used, certain sectors, it's going to work really well there. It's going to be more straightforward to introduce it. And that's where the merchant really needs to say, are we right, right now, for this particular thing? And um, one of the things I would encourage any viewers to look at is in the UK for the uh, the digital pound. The digital pound initiative is really moving forward quite strongly, and that, that initiative will, will will see some lessons, some prototyping, and, and I think it'll be a, a really good way for merchants to at least uh, educate themselves uh, in a relatively safe way. So a few more questions here that have shown up. What are the big themes and tech trends at the show? I don't know if I, any of you have had a chance to walk around. Any big themes emerge oh, I, 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 Yeah. Well, I, I would say, I mean, the one that really does stand out for me, and I've kind of alluded to it, is in the, the area of uh, self-service. You know, we, 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 we see what Amazon are actually uh, demonstrating here today. Um, you know, opening up their technology to uh, other, other retailers, other bricks and mortar retailers to, to employ. Something that doesn't, necessarily use biometrics to identify somebody, but just, you know, associates you, um, or let's, let's just say, um, identifies you through um, your use of a palm as you, as, as you go into
into a store environment, but thereafter not tracking you with the biometrics, but just looking to see where you shop, what you buy, and what goes into your basket and so on that they, they actually bill you with. Now I think um, I've only had a really quick uh, schema yeah. run. What I love is the variety. There's a lot of different solutions. Now that can be quite mesmerizing, yeah. uh, and I think this is where we really need to uh, start to introduce the narrative that choice, it's held up to be a good thing, but from a consumer point of view, and even from a merchant point of view, it can be quite a confusing thing. So starting to uh, answer some of the questions uh, that a merchant might have as they're caught in the headlights is really key. And the one thing that I've noticed is the queues for the conference uh, seminars here. Yeah. They are queuing half the hall to get into the next session for any of the conferences. And so there's a massive hunger for information to help clarify, give somebody a route map. Um, that's what I find that merchants are crying out for. They're crying out for three key things. They want to know, is this topic really something that's got longevity that I really need to elevate in my, uh, in, in my viewpoint? Uh, can I create a business case that makes any sense practically and financially for my business right now? And given where I am today, how do I get to where I need to be tomorrow? There's no point in a regulator or a FinTech sort of saying, hey, it's really cool over here on FinTech Island, and uh, you're over there, Mr. Merchant, in the weeds or on this, in the swamp. <coughs> Nobody's, we've got to build a bridge send out the lifeboats to bring those merchants into this grand utopia that we can all see, and it does actually exist, but we need to help those merchants on that journey. I, I, I think there's some really innovative stuff, but if, if, I, if I were to characterize it, it's really simple. It's like we've had two years and everything's just got better. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm not seeing anything wild and crazy. What I'm seeing is really nice hardware, really nice software that's starting to work better with other things. I'm starting to see things a lot more data centric, a lot more intelligence. You know, it, it, it's you know, some of the kit you've got to understand here. No. Some really nice looking things. Smaller, leaner, sharper, more powerful. You know, again, I use the turn of phrase at the, the kind of top of the bill, but the point of trust. You know, having devices that can do many, many things really, really well. And you can see that, you know, the, the time of the past couple of years has been invested in really sharpening our pencils and getting better equipment, better capability really refining those ideas, so when we all come back out, you know, we can really push on. So I don't think it's been kind of crazy innovation, I think it's just better of what we've and got. And I think that's a really crucial point, because we saw, um, it, it, we weren't expecting it at all, and, and nor do I hope, and I, I would never hope for another uh, cataclysmic, uh, catalyst moment like we saw two years ago. Let's just park that for the rest of our lives. Let's, let's hope it's regulation or legislation or technology that's going to drive change. But what we did see was organizations, particularly the merchants, responding very quickly and they did something. Yeah. Now what I'm seeing is what they put in place was a kind of quick and dirty response yeah. And now we're going to see, so it's not like the market's dead, it's not like everybody's moved from face to face to e-commerce. They did, but they didn't put the best solutions in right then. So there's a refinement process, an elevation process. So the market's wide open, and these merchants are starting to realize that what they put in place two years ago actually needs dialed up a little bit. And so hopefully, if but what you're saying is right, which I think it is, we're going to see that. But that reaction was phenomenal. We had merchants, we helped go online in 24 hours, yeah. it was crazy. But it was the only way their business were going to survive and they had yeah. to get online. But it, but they did it quick and dirty and then now what they've got, they've opened up like a whole new part of their business yeah. and suddenly it's like, this is interesting, we can do something here. And, and, and those businesses, the ones that managed to adjust to digitalize have really flourished because now they're starting to really challenge everything and not saying, well, retail works this way in the physical space, retail works this way online. They now see it as a continuum again and go, right, okay, where do we go with this? <coughs> and that appetite then stimulates us all to do better and to bring more interesting things through. And I think you know that that's that's been key. It's been fantastic. One more question. Um, that's a big one. What do you see as the big challenges in payments today? Oh I I'd always have to lead with regulation. <laughs> um, you know, regulation I guess really is um, you know, one of the biggest impediments to progress. I think, um, you know, businesses like ours and like others, you know, all, all have to, uh, you know, deal with regulation. Sometimes it brings opportunity. I mean, I've, 
probably in this last couple of years we've all been uh, you know, a, a, a addressing the, the requirements of PSD2 and strong customer authentication yeah. and its impact on the market, particularly in e-commerce. I think the merchants clearly now uh, are, are understanding its full yeah. ramifications and although we've all built solutions for it, uh, I'd say that many of the merchants themselves are on a learning curve and only just beginning to appreciate the importance of uh, you know, meeting, meeting the regulatory requirements. So that certainly, for me, is one of the biggest issues. Yeah. I, I, I certainly go over regulation, you can't ignore it. You know, it, it's a challenge to deal with, but it also stimulates innovation, you know, for yeah, me as yeah, well. Yeah. It does force you to do things and react, which then kind of just, you know, kind of clears the, the ground a bit. I, I, I think at the moment we're still in a period of diversification. There's so many new and interesting things that it's just complex. And I come back to again, ultimately, you know, do we go out, we balloon, then maybe we come back in again, maybe there's a little bit of a shakeout, you know, you start to see some of the kind of the dead wood drop away. Nice idea, but maybe not going to cut it. And then you're left with a strong, and then we develop on, and then you start the next cycle of innovation. I think we're kind of maybe still in that diversification thing, lots of good ideas, lots of exploration, but the world is getting too complex. And I think at some point that will bite and it will be hard because there's only so much money to go around, so much appetite. You know, and particularly right now, we've seen markets come back hard, everything starts to look good, stock markets go back up, and then suddenly we have a war, we have real rampant inflation, you know, we have some real heavy challenges to deal with, and suddenly that share wallet, to your point earlier, you know, it's only going to go so far, so time to make choices. So, you know, simplification is going to be key. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo both of those. I'm particularly close to the regulatory space, and I think in the UK, We've actually got some very, very interesting opportunities uh, with Brexit for the uh, payment systems regulator and the Financial Conduct Authority to be bold, uh, show some determination and say actually uh, this is a big enough market in its own right. Uh, we need to maintain the international interoperability but actually there are some things that could really free up the market uh, to, to help uh, accelerate the pace of the adoption of innovation uh, if only they could find that within themselves to be a little bit more bold uh, and, and just uh, big, a lot less restrictive and, and um, oppressive uh, on the industry as, as, as Tony says. Uh, paraphrasing what you said, I'm not sure whether you were quite saying it was oppressive, but um, <laughs> I, would, I would use that term. Restrictive but I think also bit. the regulators do recognize their role in the industry and I think if, if, if they can help catalyze positive change, then we're all in a good place. For me, the biggest uh, single issue is that we've got to find a way to give the merchant organization, the retailers, but right across all merchant categories, airlines, grocery, parking, insurance, utilities, whoever, all of that spread, give them a voice. Make sure that their voice is in really early on, because the gestation period of some of these innovations is so long that we need to be building <coughs> um, the, the change into the process as early as we possibly can. Well, I want to thank you three for your time and for your expertise and your perspectives. Paul Rogers, Chairman at Vendorcom, Simon Fairbairn, Head of Professional Services, ZMEA at Ingenico, and Tony Hammond, SVP, Global Product Delivery at Freedom Pay. It's been a pleasure. I hope we can do this again next year. Really happy to. This is great fun. And, and revisit some of these topics and see if we got any of them right. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also invite our viewers to join us again at, uh, looks like three o'clock, will be ha another interview right here from the Retail Tech Show in London at the Freedom Pay Block. Look forward to seeing you. <laughs>